what the fuck do I practice? Okay, so my name is Marosh. I teach embodiment. And over the years, I've helped hundreds, maybe thousands of people with this question of like, what do I do embodiment-wise? Like, what's going to be my embodied practice? Um, good one to look at on New Year's. I do this myself, usually between Christmas and New Year's. But if you're watching this in the future, hello, people in spandex in the future. Um, it, you could do this any time of year. But just happen to be recording it. This time of year, I think it's a nice thing to assess for New Year's. Okay, so in this video, I'm going to look at what you practice, how you make that decision, where you might be going wrong with that, some rubrics, some kind of algorithms, some way to think about that, um, some suggestions, um, and some nonsense as well. But basically, what do I practice this year? Um, if you're thinking about that question, um, you're not alone. I think it's easy to get lost. And we the basic idea is we can't do everything. If you're into embodiment, for this, this channel or this podcast, you're probably going, well, I love this. I mean, every time I have a guest on, I'm like, oh, I want to do their thing, I want to do that thing. And then, you know, basically realize like, I can't do it all. Um, so then my, I'm left with this question. So what do I do? You know, like most of you, I'm pretty busy. I run a business as well as practicing embodiment, as well as teaching it. You know, I run a company, I have a normal job in some ways, do emails and meetings and blah, 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 Zoom calls, et cetera. So we're left with this question, you know, what do I do? Because I can't do everything. I have limited time, limited money, limited energy, et cetera. Um, and then one answer is just do what you're always doing, which, of course, is fine if you want to get what you've always got. If you've got no problems and your life's great and your practice is giving you everything you need, then, of course, keep doing it. Um, now, if it sounds like I'm being a bit negative on what you've always been doing, that's not necessarily the case. Like, if your life's pretty sorted, if you don't have, like, major issues that are already fucking you up, something's not broke, maybe don't fix it. Maybe just keep doing what you're doing. That's the first thing I'd say, is there's something to be said for digging a deep well. So there's this saying that if you want to find water, you don't dig five shallow wells, you dig one deep well to get to the water table, you know? And in some ways, any embodied practice will open up into everything else. So, for example, uh, practice I did a lot of over the years was Aikido. Started with Aikido. I'll, I'll use Aikido as an example a few times in this, this talk. Um, and if you do Aikido for long enough, you discover mindfulness. You discover relationality. You might discover emotions, though not so much. You probably discover aesthetics. I discovered body work because I got injured, you know, friends trying to heal each other, help each other out. Um yeah, you start looking at things therapeutically a little bit. You know, you don't have to, and you might be blind to that because Aikido is not really designed for that, which is the key. But if you're paying attention, you know, there's a lot of stretching, so effectively I'm, you know, becoming a yogi at that point. Uh, I'm doing Aikido with partners, has a dance-like quality. Like, almost everything opens up within Aikido. Not everything, but almost everything. If you're paying attention, if you do something long and deep enough, yeah? Um. Also, you go through stages within that. So you end up, you know, Aikido changes and flows and you end up developing different parts of yourself at different times. So given that, why don't we just do one thing? Why don't we just pick something that we've enjoyed or we're already doing, do anything? Um, and I'd say if you're a beginner, that's good. If you're a beginner, you can sort of stop this now. I, mean, don't, I suppose I should say that for YouTube, for the algorithm, you should watch at the end. However, if you're a beginner, just do what you enjoy. The best practice is the one you, you will do. And that is based really mostly on enjoyment and convenience. These are major factors that are horribly underrated. Um, and if you begin it, that is absolutely fine. Is it an embodiment practice? Well, if you're trying to get more embodied, it should be sort of slow enough or gentle enough that it doesn't uh, like traumatize you out of your body, doesn't shock you out of your body, that you're developing some body awareness through it, or else it's, you know, it's just an exercise or whatever, which is fine. But if you want an embodiment practice, anything that gets you in your body, pleasure is your friend, enjoyment is your friend, do what you like, do what's easy and fun. You know, if the yoga studio is next to your house, it's probably the best yoga studio, even if it's not the best yoga studio in other ways. Same if your friend or your wife, you know, there's one yoga class my wife used to go to. That's the best yoga class. Why? Because my wife likes it. So she drags me or I drag her and we help each other out, you know. Um, and it was close to a house. Teacher was friendly. You know, these kind of mundane factors are really important in what should I do. So don't um, look at this scruffy top. People on podcasts can't see. You've got a scruffy top. So don't underestimate those mundane factors in picking your practice for this year. And I'd say, you know, if your life's generally pretty good and um, what you're doing seems to be working great, you can keep doing it, <laughs> fine. Um, or if you're a beginner, just do what you love. Do what you enjoy. Do what you're drawn to. 
do what you're going to get obsessed by. Though I would say, caveat to that, commit to it. So it's very common we have a honeymoon period with a practice. You're like, oh, I've just done tango and I love tango. Just like, you know, I love like, you know, It's like, yeah, talk, talk to me in three months. So I would say, you know, a three-month kind of 90-day commitment of depends on your lifestyle, how much you can practice. Little and often is great, but, you know, it might be impossible to do half an hour by keto five times a week. So more realistic is two times a week. Less than that is more like maintenance level. Three times a week is great if you can. Four, if you're kind of getting like a serious professional, you don't have kids, you don't have a serious job, whatever. Four is great. Um, but two or three times a week is pretty good for yoga, martial arts, dance, whatever. You know, one to two hours at a time, normally not four hours at a time, just so much, so much you can assimilate. Just do what you enjoy, do what's convenient. If you're a beginner, that's fine. Yeah, but commit to it so you don't quit after the honeymoon period so you actually get to some uh, depth with it. Which is kind of another question we might have in choosing a practice is, well, how deep do I want to go in this? See, so, yeah, my experience is I try lots of things. I try almost anything. I'll, like if I'm at a festival and it's like some weird type of acro, dolphin, tantric yoga, I'll fucking try it. Why not? Could do everything once, you know, you're in Berlin or whatever, you know? Um, or it's just something that's rare where you are. Try everything once if you can, right? Particularly if you're a professional in this field. But just as a beginner, why not? It might be the best thing you ever tried. Um, however, um, there's a minimum amount to really get into something, I'd say, with that honeymoon period and a little bit of, you know, for me, two, three months, kind of past that period, you're into a bit more of an actual relationship with it. I like to do a year of something in some depth. Like I just did a year of weightlifting, I did a year of Feldenkrais, I did a year of tango, conscious dance. A year will kind of, you get like 80% of what you can get out of something in the first year. This is really interesting, actually. The learning curve, yes, it goes deeper over time, but you, your learning curve will actually slow down, okay? So someone that's done two years of Aikido hasn't learned twice as much as someone that's done one year. They've learned maybe 20% more. Okay, so we could also look at this like, okay, yes, there's the depth issue, like take some depth to get into things. And like, you know, like a marriage or relationship, you might have after 10 years, there's another level of depth you just don't get to with shallow wells. However, learning curves slow down. And I'd say if you want to become more embodied, want to learn more about embodiment, you might be better off doing one thing for 10 years plus five things for two years rather than two things for 10 years. Does that make sense? Got breadth as well as depth. Yeah. Now, if you're an embodiment professional, slight different emphasis there. Right. It's like because I'm learning about the breadth of this field, I'm missing stuff in my original art. So this comes back to our original point. This is kind of the main thrust of the whole podcast slash YouTube video. <laughs> what shall I choose? Well, here's the key question. The key thing. The key thing is not just what do I enjoy, unless you're a complete beginner. The key thing is not what did Mark do or what did my hero Wendy Palmer do or whoever. Um, the key thing is, what do you want to build? Two ways of looking at this. What skill do I want to build? Or we can look at it, same thing, just through a different lens. What quality do I want to build? All right? Let's go back to Aikido as an example. Aikido is great for learning certain skills, depending on the teacher, the style. Come back to that. That's important. But Aikido is great for generally for learning certain things. Uh, however, it's shit for learning other things. And I'll give an example. I did like keto for a long time. And yes, I'm learning aesthetics, but it's not like when you go to tango and there's music and women in beautiful dresses, whose perfume you could smell. I, mean, I never smelled anyone's perfume in Aikido. So all of a sudden I was dealing with sensuality and aesthetics and musicality. Now, could you deal with those things in Aikido? Like the sexual tension with your partner? I mean, it's not really the culture. It's not really the form. Practices are optimized to develop certain skills, either consciously or unconsciously, depending on the school or teacher. So in Aikido, you're going to get very good at developing some things, not so good for others. It's actually got blind spots and just you, one practice can't build everything. Embodiment is too big a topic. The skill set's too wide. So key thing, key thing, beyond just I want to be more embodied, I want to be more my body, beginner's level. Key thing for most of you listening to this yeah, is what do I want to build? So people come to me and they say, should I do Aikido? Because maybe they heard that Strozzi did Aikido or I did Aikido or whatever. And I'm like, well, that depends. And I always say, what are you trying to build? And they go, oh, I don't know. I just, I think I should do Aikido. I'm like, why? 
And they say, well, I'm trying to build, uh, I'm trying to be doing uh, practice centering. I said, great. And depending on the school and the teacher, you could practice centering. They're like, you know, that could be a good place to learn centering. You've got, you know, a good school, have a calibrated, you know, you start with wrist grabs and you go on to karate chops and punches and gradually there's space to build that up and, and work with that. It could be a great place to practice centering. However, if that's all you want to practice, you might be better off just having a cold shower every day. You know, it takes five minutes a day, you get more centering practice or doing breath holds, something even simpler. All right. Something about the sort of cultural, communal, but also sort of almost mythopoetic nature of an art like yoga, Aikido, or something that has a whole ethos, mythos, culture that comes with it will enhance that. But just from the skills point of view, is it the most efficient way to do it? Yeah. Now, again, if the mythos, the poetry, the dressing up in the cool Aikido clothes does it for you, that might actually motivate you to do the other stuff. So it's not just to go one way or the other, but just to consider that. Yeah. So what's the skill you want to build? Uh, equally, let's say someone says, hey, I want to be better at being embodied with my kids. Right. That's the ultimate life outcome they want. They want to be more playful with their children. Say, you know, I know people that are, oh, I find it difficult to play with my children. Oh, that's sad. OK. So. Let's say they're doing yoga and they've got a really disciplined, nice Iyengar yoga practice, really good for body awareness because you've got all these millions of cues and you're trying to be aware of your body, really good for self-regulation. Rubbish for playfulness. Rubbish for that quality. It's the other way of looking at this. Or the skill of relationality, of playful relationality. You might get more of that in certain kinds of Aikido clubs, certain, you know, definitely in improv, certain kind of acro yoga clubs. Again, depends on the club, the teacher, the style, the general situation. But is the practice likely to build that skill that you want in your life? Because ultimately, that's the reason, right? If we're looking at embodied practice as an education process, if you're looking at embodiment simply as a state shifter, like a holiday, yeah, or like getting drunk, having, having a coffee, nothing wrong with shifting our state we shift our state many times a day generally um however it's not really educational and we're not trying to make it educational and you say oh i kind of want both it's like yeah but what are you really trying to do what are you really trying to focus on you know you know a yoga teacher might combine those things it's true but it's good to have a focus okay man who chased two rabbits catch neither says slightly uh stereotyped asian sounding saying okay so um, what skill am I trying to build? Keep coming back to that. Or quality. So you can look at quality through different lenses. Those of you who study toolkit with me, that's 26 possibilities. Dylan Newcomb, I think, has, I think, 16 in his white system. Four elements, really simple one we use when you can understand intuitively listening to this. Now, um, four elements, exactly as they sound, qualities, exactly as they sound, intuitively, Peter being fiery or Paul being earthy, we kind of get what that means. We might argue about the details, but we kind of get it. So um, what quality do you need? Yeah. Generally, what we're doing in embodiment is building range. Okay. So behavioral flexibility, they call it in psychology, building range. So um, I tend to be more fiery, airy person. So for me, when I do my younger based yoga class, I did for many years in Brian, very good for me to develop my earth side. Uh, equally, if I'm doing um, a very like contact dance and movement, listening and flowing, much my water side, very good for me to build that range. So I'm not just doing the air and fire Mark Walsh thing. I have more possibilities. I'm not a hammer who sees everything as a nail and hits everything as if it were a nail, okay? So looking at qualities, what quality do I want to build? Now, so far, so, so good, right? So it's like, hey, if you're doing what you're doing, it's easy, keep doing it. If you don't know what to do, you're new, just do something you like, something's easy, fine. If you want to build a bit of range, you might want to pick something that builds you a skill or a quality that you haven't yet embodied that you might want to work with. It's pretty simple what I'm saying. I could probably be replaced with an AI fairly soon, couldn't I? This is a very simple algorithm in many ways. This is years of talking to people to work this out. Uh, however, there's another there's another thing. So one, we have like experience level. Okay, so so far I've mentioned beginner. Let's say intermediate. Intermediate is someone who's got at least one embodied practice of a few years experience. And they, yeah, maybe it's time to branch out, you know, cross train, do a few more things. Um, last factor I'll come to in the end will be a uh, kind of professional level skill. However, before, so a skill level, experience level, we've got another factor, Oop. okay, which is how resourced you are. 
So let's say there's three levels of this. So survival level, you're really screwed right now. Your mum just died. You've got mental illness. You've lost your job. Life is really tough. This was me some of last year. Life does get really tough. Life is hard. At this point, your embodied practice is that that you can and that which sustains you. That which is going to save your life is your priority. You can't be embodied if you're dead. So um, just, and it could just be state shifting things, yoga classes that feel nice, massages that feel nice, saunas that feel nice, stuff that feels good. Got to be careful you don't have a false economy here that also is wholesome, that it's sustaining, right? Like, I don't know, watching porn might feel good, but it's a disembodying practice that isn't going to be good for your well-being or your relationships in the medium term, let alone the long term. Okay, so without using a false economy, what nourishes us, what supports us? Sometimes it's like, what gets us through the fucking day? You know, like I've got a lot of sympathy if you're having a tough year. Like I'm doing all right now, but, you know, it wasn't that long ago. I wasn't. I remember what that's like. And this might be deeply familiar practices. Like I can go back to a familiar Aikido club with familiar people, do a familiar practice. It's easy on some level. It's not challenging. I've got enough challenge in my life some days. Got enough challenge in life? Don't add any more. Okay. But here's the problem. If we just do what's easy, we actually get weaker and we get narrower. So if you can, if you're not at survival level, if you're just a kind of life's a bit tricky, which is sort of most of us, most of the time, right? Normal level, then mix your practices with things that feel good, that are nourishing, that are pleasant. Maybe you're not learning that much. Maybe you're just deepening an existing practice. You're kind of going the long way around. It's not too threatening or challenging, it just, you know, deepening the groove of what you're already good at, which, by the way, is underrated. It's good to be great at something, not just to be average at everything. Um, yeah, great. Do most of that and then some challenge. Okay, it's like the shit sandwich. Challenge, easy, challenge, easy. Okay, or one class a week. It's like, oh, my God, I really struggle to follow. And oh, I really hate following my husband in dance, but it's so good for me and so good for our relationship, but I'm learning something. So it's necessity-led. Okay, rather than kind of enjoyment led in the short term. You may, there's a sort of middle ground, which is what I call the arranged marriage, which is like you don't really enjoy it first, but then gradually you learn to love it, which is the case with a lot of practices, actually. I find if something's too challenging or they're just going to hate it forever, don't go there. Like find something which is sort of, uh, you're actually going to go to, you know, that's accessible. Uh, it's like, yeah, you know, it's kind of annoying, but it's I can hand, I do yoga, so I'm going to learn playfulness through acro yoga. I'm not going to have to improv because I'll die if I get improv. It's too much. There's this thing in coaching where a lot of coaches are like, you should do the thing that you fear most. And it's like, yeah, most of us can't be fucked and aren't going to. Okay. So something that, yes, challenges you, but not to the point where you hate it, where you dread seeing it in your diary. But that's a bit of effort. Okay, if you just do what's easy and there's no effort, you will get weaker, you will get narrower, you get more brittle, you get more fundamentalist. It's no good. So if if you sort of life's a bit challenging but not survival mode, <coughs> then mix it up. Some things that are easy and pleasant and deepen an existing group, some things that are new, that build range, that have the challenge. As most people, most people, right? Most people, as me most of the time. Third group, this was me the other week, okay? Um, ideal conditions. All right. So if your life is, you're doing pretty well, your know, kids have left home, we haven't had any yet, work's either ticking over or maybe you're independently wealthy or your job's just kind of easy and pleasant and chill. You've got friends, you live in a nice house, you're definitely not, you know, starving or anything, you're not in a war like some of my friends in Ukraine. Ideal conditions. This is where we should really go for it. So load your practice with difficult things. Really do the things that are challenging. You know, sometimes I'm like, right, I need a week off work after doing this because it's going to fuck me up. But I'm going to learn something. So that would be a kind of heroic practice. Yeah, so we've got survival, normal, and heroic. Eh, what a nice system. I should write that down. Um, if you're in the mood for that. And this might be part of your day, part of your week, part of your month, part of your year, part of your life. There's different scales of this. It could be you engineer some of your life to enable heroic practice. Let me give some examples of that. Um, could be that you engineer one or two weeks retreat a year at a meditation center. Beautiful. 
and don't come in exhausted, right? Have a run up to that when you're not exhausted. So it can be heroic and not just survival again. Um, it could be I took a month out to do yoga. I did yoga three times a day, did almost no work that month, but it took me a few months to set it up. Another time I did a three month sabbatical, it took me two years to set that up. Okay. But I set it up, you know, that's a guy who runs a company, busy guy. Won't be able to do that when I have kids, right? Which is what we're planning now. And um, I, if I said to my wife, oh, yeah, I'm disappearing to Japan for three months, she's going to be like, no, you're not. Here's the washing up cloth. All right, here's the diapers. Um, so this is a sort of life situation that I was lucky enough to um, and clever enough to arrange. Uh, when I was young, I was a living Aikido student. If you're under 25 you know, or under 30 and don't have kids, and haven't yet found the career of your dreams and, you know, hardcore career pr- progression. If those factors, you know, relatively healthy, those factors are true. You are lucky. Now is the time. Go live in a yoga studio. Go live in an Aikido dojo. Do, you know, live on beans and rice and devote all your time to conscious dance or yoga, whatever you enjoy. Really get into it. And Because I, I say, like, it is difficult once you've got a career. All my colleagues and kids say it's even more difficult my friends who are older say, you know what, it's great. I love being older. It's got some advantages, but you just don't have the energy anymore. You know, I know Buddhist monks who are like, meditate now, because when you're 70, you know, you're on your deathbed, it'll be too late. Yeah, 80, 90, whatever. Um, so if you're young, if you're, or if you're just in those ideal conditions, you might be, you know, a 50-year-old that just happens, the kids have left home, you've got independently wealthy because you've made all your money on Bitcoin and you've got great health and energy levels. Fucking great. You know, great. I just say, if you're 25, there's no excuse, kids. Get on with it. Get off TikTok. Um, there you go. If you're, you know, you want to really go into this stuff. So that's the heroic type practice. Okay. You with me so far? Beginners, do what the fuck you want. Enjoy yourself, whatever's convenient. Um, intermediate, you might want to add, you know, some sort of balance. Might want to add a second practice. Might want to see what skill or quality is missing. Particularly if you're not in survival mode, you've got a bit of resourcefulness going on, or you're able to engineer that like heroic kind of thing. Um, what should I practice? So the basic thing, Shinzen Young, meditation teacher, is good on this. He's been an influence, as has uh, Richard Strozzi Heckler on practice. But the, the way I usually say it is, it's like this convenience, like opportunity that could be like I'm traveling and there just happens to be a yoga studio really close to my house. So I'm going to go do yin yoga tomorrow because it's right there. Okay, that's opportunity. And then there's desire. Like sometimes you just call to something. I remember when I was like getting called to tango and I had to stay up all night to one in the morning at these malongas. And I was like, this is so not me and it doesn't suit my life. And I have to go across town and it's expensive and I have to buy new shoes, but I still did it. Because that internal desire was so strong and that is worth following. You know, I had that with MMA, I had that with tango. Like if you're tuned into that, you can ride that a long way. Just add a bit of commitment to it so it's not just jumping around if you're an airy person like me. So we have the convenience, you know, the practicality, we have uh, the desire, and then the last one, the necessity. Like what do I actually need? What do I, what defines that? Um, for most of us is what would help my life, right? So the purpose of embodiment is an embodiment. Like, that's weird, okay? Purpose of embodiment is your values. Like, think of what you care about. It could be your kids, it could be learning, it could be your job, it could be making money, it could be getting laid a lot, whatever, okay? Start with what you actually care about because then you'll be motivated from your actual values and you don't have to tell anyone, just be honest, you know? Someone said to me, oh, I'm 22 and I want to, like, get laid a lot. I'd be like, right, here's some embodied practices that will help and hopefully deepen a little bit while you're there. But, you know, fine. Or, you know, I'm a busy single mom and I'm tired and I want some practices to help with my stress. Great. <laughs> so starting with your actual values, the best practices are the ones that will build the skills you need. Okay, Change the state, yes, that can be helpful, but even better, build the skills or build the being, the quality that you need to improve your actual fucking life. Okay? Your actual life. And um, that's what the point is. So start there. What would make me a better parent? Would it be more empathy? Would it be more influence? Would it just be more resilience, more state regulation? You know, every, I'd say body awareness is kind of a foundation. So this is why I recommend, for example, my students, they all meditate. Like if you want to be my student, that's the deal. You meditate five or six days a week, 10 to, 10 to 30 minutes a day. That's the deal. Um yeah, and there's things that help get practices in daily life, the life transfer stuff, 
talk about that elsewhere, but things just like having an alarm that goes off five times a day that you can quickly check in and send to. So you're spreading out, peppering the learning rather than having like two hours of Aikido and then on the computer back to your life, right? So some kind of transfer stuff is really helpful. Anyway, where was I? Your values, doing things that are actually help you, that improve your actual life. That's the point. Okay, that's the point. Um, the thing with human beings, particularly guys, if I'm going to be sexist, is we get geeky and we obsess about the vehicle and not the destination. Was it Bruce Lee? Another Asian co- comment. It is like a finger pointing at the moon. Do not look at the finger or you will miss all the heavenly glory. It's my very bad Bruce Lee impression. Apparently it's an old uh, Confucian, I think, saying, maybe Taoist. Anyway, what does that mean? It means don't get obsessed with the art for its own sake, the tango moves, the Aikido throws, you know. I used to be so obsessed with the minutia of a wrist lock, and I go, but why? You know, why? So you have to focus on the vehicle or else you don't have a path, but tend, people tend to over-focus on the vehicle and miss the fact, like, is this actually helping my life. You know, Aikido people say, hey, do Aikido to be healthy? And then they'd be like limping everywhere because they'd be injured the whole time from doing so much Aikido and bashing each other up too much. I'm like, well, what's the point, you know? Okay, so focusing on the um, life goals, the life transfer is really key. And I'd say if your art isn't transferring into your life, and there's reasons for that, sometimes art's a sort of compensatory or they're sort of in an island, they're isolated, you might want to look at how to make it transfer or get another practice, okay? Because um, by your own values, it's not doing that much good. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, I think they're the main things for most people. Uh, there's kind of a third weird group um, who'd be embodiment teachers. Oh, people like me, weird people. So if you're an embodiment professional, meaning you're an embodiment coach, an embodiment trainer, maybe a yoga teacher, a conscious dance teacher, I know a bunch of you, a bunch of you freaks like me listen to this. Um, so we have a slightly different consideration, I would say. Okay, so we still have the same basic considerations of you know our well-being, our survival, you know that level, our building range. Um, I think is particularly important for us. Um, why is building range particularly important? Well, so we can serve more students. Right, I want to be able to relate to more kinds of students. Uh, also, it's important that we have a range of practices. So range in our own being means, well, we're just more effective. We can teach more people better. I can, you know, if I'm going to coach the four elements, I need to be able to go deeply into the four elements. And here's the thing, not just as deep as my client, I need to have gone 10 times deeper so I'm completely comfortable with my client. Yeah, so if, let's say my client's doing uh, anger and reowning anger right? If I haven't like got really into like rage and fierceness and screaming and fucking hitting things, well, a little bit of anger is going to be too much. And they're going to feel that and not go there or get overwhelmed by it. I can't hold it. I get overwhelmed. I'm no longer coaching them. It's no good. So we need to have gone much deeper into whatever we're doing, much like 10 times deeper than what you're teaching in terms of state or content or anything else. Um, so, so the range we need is actually phenomenal. We need really strong range. Or else we're just not going to be able to support a lot of clients, we're not going to be able to empathize with them, we're not going to, to give them all they need. So I'd say this is a, a key project for us who are professionals in this field. Uh, equally, it's really important that we don't, we're not fundamentalist because embodiment is so broad, so many perspectives. There's a big difference between an embodiment teacher with one perspective and two. Now, three, four, five, yes, that's helpful. But the big difference is between Yoga is everything. I love yoga. Or it used to be me. I love Aikido. Aikido is everything. And someone who has another point of view. So, well, you know, Aikido is really good at combativeness, but tango is about play and sensuality and sexiness and fashion. And, you know, that, that's a whole other side of life. Yeah. So we could look at relationships through the lens of combat or through the lens of flirting or do a bit of improv now through the lens of like comedy and play, you know, and amusing and playfulness. To see what I mean. So now I, I've got a different way of looking at life. Uh, I've got a less fundamentalist, less rigid view of embodiment. Okay. And um, plus, so this is range building, but also understanding more than one point of view is so helpful as an embodiment professional. Um, more than that, we also need to know where to send people or to know what people are doing already. So this is where I'd say breadth becomes much more important, again, as a teacher. Um, try and do a year of like 10 things, okay? At least 10 things. It's like 10 years, you know, to develop any kind of competence, I'd say, in this art. 10 years is good. 
um, do one or two things really deeply, preferably two or three, really deeply. Like, you know, I did like get very deeply, yoga, meditation, a few things very, very deeply. Meditation usually is the base. I don't, I know very few embodiment professionals who don't meditate. In fact, I think none is the number I know. who are really good. Um, but the other thing is try everything. So I kind of alluded to this earlier, but for a different reason, not just because it's interesting, but because someone comes to you and says, I've been doing hat keto. Is that good for building fire? Is that good for self-regulation? Do you know what Hapkido is? Hapkido is the Korean version of Aikido. It's got a slightly different flavor and includes punches and kicks. Now, again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. The teacher matters. The class matters. Don't make the mistake of saying everyone should do this practice because it's all the same. No, Aikido classes are radically different in terms of the skills and the qualities in different parts of the world. Not just styles, but teachers and cultures within clubs. Um, but trying lots of things will really help. So do you know the difference between circling and authentic relating? Do you know, it's like everyone should, like, bottom teachers should have tried like 10 different yoga styles. You should know the difference between like, like, a yanga, a stanga, a hapa, acro, yin, shadow, rocket, hot. Like I've probably done 20 styles, but like minimum like 10 yoga styles. Like that's, that's like a week in a major yoga center in London. Yeah, take a week. Just go to a major yoga center and try everything. Mm. You might say, oh, I can't try every martial art because I'm 75 years old and I've got brittle bones. Okay, we'll go watch a class. <laughs> you know, watch, watch it on YouTube, if nothing else. But go to Wikipedia, put in martial arts. Fucking huge list. At least a couple of hundred martial arts exist. You know, do you know your Russian martial arts? Do you know your Korean martial arts? Do you know your capoeira? Do you know you're different? You can look on YouTube videos. Better if you can try them because the experiential taste of it is kind of part of what we're really doing here. Yeah. So, you know, trying new things regularly, going to new classes is something I do fairly frequently. Um, again, take the opportunity if it's there, you know, if you're on holiday somewhere or maybe a friend of yours says, hey, I just started Capoeira, do you want to come with me? You're like, yeah, fuck it, I'll try it, you know. I mean, the only limit there, I would say, is just safety. You know, like some martial arts clubs, I'd be like Thai boxing classes. I might be a bit cautious to go to before I've checked it out. Usually I'll let you watch a class style or you can get a recommendation, you know, go with a friend or whatever. So, um, yeah, so that's the other big thing for us who are professionals, as well as the importance of range, the importance of more and more perspectives, so range, perspective, this importance of being able to recommend things, refer things, suggest things, understand where clients are coming from when they say, hey, I've been doing Tibetan meditation. And if you've only done Theravada and you might misunderstand, you know, what that means, it's got a different flavor. But this is where we can, you know, hopefully just get geeky and enjoy all the kind of range that's out there. Plus, on top of that, you've got the professional skills, right? So um, what should I practice? Embodiment teachers come to me. Sometimes I'm like, well, you need to practice marketing. Because if you don't practice marketing, which is you've been doing yet another martial arts camp or meditation camp, yet more training in trauma, okay, uh, which I'd say should be mandatory for all embodiment teachers, some trauma training. But anyway, no, rather than yet more embodiment training, a little bit of marketing or something specific, a little bit of you know, Facebook ads training. Why? Because if you don't, you won't, you'll have to get a day job. You won't be able to keep doing what you love. You'll, you'll, you won't be able to sustain your business. You won't be able to reach people to help. Um, so that's the problem. Yeah, so often there's the professional skills, uh, marketing particularly. What should I practice? And I'm like, what should I do in my diary every week? I'm like, listen to a marketing podcast every day for an hour, five days a week. There's your lunch break sorted. Go do that. Stop fucking doing so much yoga. Take a night off. <laughs> Take a night off and read a book on marketing. Tough love from Uncle Mark. Uh, trauma stuff I mentioned. The other one is teaching. Okay, so people don't know this about me, but I'm a third generation teacher. I've studied teaching. I'm from a family of teachers. My cousin just won an award for being a, uh, a headmaster in an autistic school. Teaching is the key thing for us, or coaching if you're a coach. You can be great at your own embodiment, your own body practice, like great Aikido or yoga, and a rubbish teacher. Now, our own practice is key. So, don't go too far into this. We do need our own practice. That is a major factor in how we convey state, how we get others embodied. You know, do your own practice a couple of hours a day if you can at all. Like a musician who does the scales, it's just one of those things. However, teaching is an art. Coaching is an art. Many yoga teachers I know would be better served not from doing more yoga, but just doing a basic intro course on teaching yoga, right? Or teaching generally even. OK, so don't neglect the transfer skills of teaching, coaching, whatever your modality is, not just, you know, more and more embodiment. Again, that being said, your own embodiment is maybe the most single most important factor, but learn to teach and coach as well. 
Yeah, being good at Aikido doesn't make you a good Aikido teacher, to come back to that example. Okay. Oh, must be lunchtime. This has gone on for a while. And I've got 10% battery left. All right. So in summary, if you're struggling to survive, just practice what feels good, what gets you through the day. If you've got a little bit of capacity, do something, or you're not a complete beginner, build something that builds a bit of range. Start with what am I trying? to build either a skill or a quality and then we also have we look at enthusiasm you know where's the enthusiasm at major factor convenience you know cost travel time is a huge one you know like i know people are like, oh you should go to this yoga class i'm like it's an hour there and an hour back and i'm busy so that means it's three and a half hours out of my day maybe i'll just do the zoom class which isn't quite as good but it's only one hour out of my day you know um so convenience the urge and then the necessity, what are you actually trying to build? Three main factors. There's others, but they're the main ones. Obviously, you know, we've got to look at this through the lens of ethics. This is ethical. Remembering that the style or the art is not the same as the teacher. Better the better teacher with the wrong art than the wrong teacher with the better art. Where you do it, who you do it with, all those things make a difference to, you know, what's being built, what's actually being embodied at the end of it. At the end, the proof's in the pudding. And I think we need a feedback loop where we practice and then we we say to people, am I looking different? Is something changing? Or even better, they're telling us without being asked, right? Like, hey, Mark, something's changed. Do I get, hey, Mark, you got softer. Or, hey, Mark, you seem more confident. Is anything changing? Again, if not, we might want to look at, one, the life transfer, and then two, potentially changing the practice. Um, if not, lastly, I concluded with the sort of professionals, you know, those who are in the professional field might have wider um considerations what they should practice there's a few thoughts uh, i've got other podcasts and videos on practice look those up there's plenty in my books on practice and obviously if you study with me you know if you're a mentee or a student i will sit down with you and work this through personally it is a little tricky um doing it um just generally on the internet to the masses of whoever's out there um it's often you know i'll sit down with a student and part of it's intuitive. I just go, you know what? You would really benefit from trying tango. You want to give that a try? And maybe they, I send them on an experiment. And they try three dance classes and they come back and then we pick one and they do that for the next three months, right? So there's experimenting. Um, but it's also intuitive. It's also knowing that person's life conditions. It's knowing what they've done before, knowing their personality type, knowing what town they live in, you know, whether they like online or don't like online training. You know, there's all those factors, right? Um yeah, so I think it can make it a little trickier. So I kind of neglected the online versus online stuff, so let me add that in at the end here. Um, so online is better for convenience. It's better if there's a practice that isn't locally available, like I do a continuum class online because there isn't one, you know, generally where I am, more obscure things. Uh, it can feel safer for some people to do practice in their own house or do a camera off. So some trauma backgrounds or something very challenging might be the shallow end of the pool can feel safer. Um, so you shouldn't be snobs about it. Also, you know, just you know, you're not having the cost of time and energy like getting on the tube and going across London is exhausting. So online is underrated for those reasons. However, being in the same place and resonating with people in the room is a huge part of what embodied learning is. Body learning isn't learning about something. It's not just learning a skill. Technically, it's being immersed in a culture, in a place, in a club, in a in a field with a group of people, and that is going to teach you. Like I learned as much from being in Aikido dojos with Aikidoka as I did from like the technical skills. Right, like you know when in the Matrix where he's like, I know kung fu. No, you wouldn't. You would know the skills of kung fu, but you wouldn't have been immersed in kung fu. And you know, Lester somehow did that to the brain as well that immersion in the culture of Kung Fu and the how that impacts you as a person is as big, if not bigger than a skill. Uh, and that definitely comes through touch, through moving together, through being together. That I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but in the modern world I do. Like that is irreplaceable. Um, and, I, you know, for example, on a, one, the, the students I most like teach are the ones who study with me online. So they pace their learning, they spread it out, which is great. So they're not overwhelmed. They practice over time. They practice in their own context, which is great for life transfer. There's not a bonus. But then they come to work with me in intensives a couple of times in the year. So we get that felt sense and we can play with it and deepen it in that way. So this is a bit on online versus in person. 
Okay, I think I've covered most of it by now. As I said, lots more resources I've put out there. Hopefully that sets up your, the most important practice that I remember is the one that you do. That's the most important fucking practice, the one that you do. So um, sometimes I'm a credible snob about practice, but on the whole, I would just say, you know what? If you're doing something that's getting you in your body, you're not hurting anyone else, it's going to be radically good for you in your life. I just want to encourage everyone listening to this to do some kind of embodied practice. It will make a huge difference from your life, how you treat other people and the entire world. So fucking, if you're listening to this in January 1st, shake off your hangover and get on with it, mate. My well, if you like that, you probably like embodimentunlimited.com and our app. Um, so on both of these things, you can get a bunch of podcasts that aren't available here and some exclusive ones with some big names and people you'll probably recognize that are over there. Um, there's um, a copy of my book, PDF, my first book on embodiment, which uh, seems to be people like. I sold quite a few copies on Amazon, but there's a free copy there. Um, what else is there? Loads of videos of me coaching embodiment, resources on trauma, on meditation, on yoga. And you can also chat to people without going on Facebook or any of that nonsense. Um, so if you want to chat embodiment with people, that's there. And it's on the embodimentunlimited.com, all free, and the app available at the App Store and all that good stuff. So if you like this, do check those out.